A is Equipment Replacement Reserve Fund. And I'll ask. policy. Uh, so this is the beginning of that process. It's not really a policy, but it just has some basic information on prior what we've done in the past. It includes how we've funded capital projects over the last five years, and it talks about the different types of items we bonded, and I broke them down into four sections, building improvements, equipment, technology, and and vehicles and this excludes all school because I wasn't a hundred percent sure if the policy actually pertains to the school or not so I didn't include them. Are you, Ruth, are you referring to the uh, box, a green box entitled funding sources? There, yes, the and green the, box shows how we funded them in the past, over the past five years, the different mm -hmm. types of items. And as you can see, the bonds was four million one hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and fifteen. So that's how we've mm -hmm. essentially been funding our capital equipment. So these are the amendments to the existing policy. No, this this no, actually this reflects history. This is just showing how we've been funding capital purchases okay. over the last I'm five years. I'm trying to understand what's new here. Oh well, this is. Uh, there's nothing new here. All this yeah. is is just historical data so we can kind of come to where we want to go with the reserve fund. Okay. Let me help you, Bill, perhaps. Um, Lou's referring to the policy. You may recall the council just adopted an update to your fiscal mm -hmm. policy. A requirement in that policy, and it's been there for some time, is the creation of this equipment reserve fund, uh, obviously to reduce our uh, need for indebtedness. We've never actually gone to the extent of creating it, much less funding it. And so, Ruth, as a starting venture uh, to try to understand this, let's look at how we've done things in the past. And beyond that, uh, she's also providing some overview as to where we're spending money in the capital budget as well. Good. So some of the items we've used to fund capital equipment have been, we've appropriated from property taxes. Uh, we've done reserves. We have beach reserves. We've done fire equipment reserve, which is our rescue vehicles. Uh, we've done impact fees, such as the Payne Road impact fee, and we've traded in vehicles. And, and so the substance, maybe, I, I might suggest is on uh, the back page of that, of that memo that uh, provides a historical analysis. Ruth has uh, indicated, I guess, eight different possible ways for us to start funding this reserve account? So can I ask a question as we go along? Sure. So I like this analysis because it shows over a five-year period, we've had $6.4 million in total capital equipment budgets, with about two-thirds of that being funded simply through bonds and the remaining one-third through other sources, so from property taxes to reserve accounts. The question I have of that for the analysis purposes, because I know that this was originally started around the discussion of depreciation and that, in essence, to get started, what you could do, I think it was uh, uh, Marjorie, uh, resident Marge de Sanctus who um, brought up and said, at the very least, you should have a policy that says that you will reserve what's equivalent to the depreciation that's on that equipment. Um, were you able, to, um, would you have access to that at some point later, maybe, I know you don't know now, but what the total appreciation would be over that five-year period, so is it 250000 a year, and it would be equivalent to a million dollars in reserve? I don't have it over a five-year period. 
We do have and, it. And you don't have to have it now, but I think that would be, for me, that would be a useful uh, benchmark to understand. Sure. So you're saying look at the actual expenditures over the last five years and say, yeah. had we chosen to, to fund the depreciated amount on an yeah, annual so basis? Yeah, so $6.4 million be, dollars in total projects. Yeah. What was the total amount of, pre of depreciation? Obviously not in the year. Well, you might get a little bit in the year. It depends on what time of year you get. You know, over, over this five-year period, how much was depreciated? Because well, that would, in essence, be the amount of your fund. Total. It's one uh, one possibility. Right. Total depreciation expense as of for June 30 through June 30, 2017, was approximately 4.4 million. That includes buildings and everything. Right. So we could break out just the yeah equipment. Because I think that the initial conversation was that, you know, um, at least for a, a test pilot series, is to start bond or start reserving only on new equipment so that. 4.4 million you're discussing is also including other items that are outside of kind of All the of scope assets. of what we're the looking school, at. School, buildings, this, right. right. Yep. No, it still begs the question, how do you fund that? What well, that does is identify... That's the second part. That it, comes to the, your solutions. That, that identifies the amount to be reserved. Correct. The question is, the next one is, how do you do that? How do we do that? So on the second page it, in, the, um, in this debt management and fiscal policy... It talks about how we were supposed to, how we we're supposed to fund some of these projects if the policy had been in place five years ago. And essentially, most of it should have been funded from other sources rather than bonds. So essentially, if I were to take the, what should have been bond, uh, funded from other sources other than bonds, over that five-year period or six-year period average, we come to about seven hundred thousand that we probably should be looking to fund annually to try and mm -hmm. borrow less and put in into a reserve. This excludes, as I mentioned, schools. So if we were to include, for example, the school techs schools tech refreshes, that would probably bring us over a million. Mm. So then I came up with a you know, eight or so ways to maybe try and fund this. Mm -hmm. um, I can list them. We could appropriate annually. We can try to use debt budget decreases, school and town, to, and allocate that difference or savings to the, the reserve fund. And as we complete actual bond issues, the full bond issues, we could take what we don't need for that next year because we've completed a bond issue and put that towards the reserve fund. The next one, I'm not 100% sure if we would need to talk to Bond Council on how we would, if we could use unspent bond proceeds towards an equipment reserve fund or if we were only allowed to use it to reduce debt. So that would be a question we need to find out. Um, we could use some overlay monies towards it. We could allocate excess revenues over estimates for specific from a specific revenue source such as, um, for example, I'm not sure I could use excise because that's supposed to be used for road maintenance, but um, the example I used was cable TV franchise fees. If we budgeted, I'm making these numbers up, 100000 and it came in at 120 we could allocate that 20000 uh, Revenue sharing revenue might be sharing. another one. Right. And then the last one is extend the time frame to sufficiently fund the equipment reserve fund to reduce the amount needed annually, because 700000 is a pretty yeah. empty number to try and fund yeah. on an annual basis without something to jumpstart that. Such as, such as finishing a debt. <coughs> it's worth noting this analysis looks at, you know, what our total bar, our capital spending has been over the last five years. I, I would argue that there are some of those purchases that are um, better than others uh, for bonding, and it's more of a philosophical um, rationale. Those that are enjoying the benefit of the use of that item are, are the ones paying for it, as opposed to um, you know, saving over time. Um, so I don't think all fit neatly into that category, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, I think this is a useful exercise. Just to understand what are our historical patterns. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wouldn't suggest we try to fund all of it. Um, I think some bonding is a necessary evil, and given the sort of rates and our current bond rating, I, I don't think that's uh, terribly bad in and of itself. Um, so I wouldn't suggest we try to do all of this, but I think this starts to indicate uh, there's there's certainly some area that we could move into. 
And we can do short-term borrowing. Which, I mean, just because it's under 100000 doesn't mean we can't borrow. It just means we do it for shorter periods of time. So those are some of the things that will help to offset the, the bonding a little. Tom, can you refresh my memory for the town of Falmouth? Um, I know that for many, many years they had a um, very different community, and I usually don't go into this comparative town kind of analysis, but I, they're, the, they're the benchmark, I guess, um, because they had excess revenue or excess uh, reserve funds that were pretty significant where all of their debt uh, was being funded through reserves until recently they just made a major uh, major change. In, uh, I can't remember what they built, but regardless, I mean, how do we ter determine when enough is enough to be saved? Yeah, I, I can't speak directly to that. I, I do know that the Falmouth is, has a distinction in their fund balance amount. They're consistently over 20% in their fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they use that. I think yeah. they, frankly, want to maintain that level of fund balance. So I'm not sure that they're funding all their capital needs out of it. Uh, otherwise, it would be depleted. Uh, I can find out more about that. I mean, do they fund an allocation into that balance as a budget line item? Yeah, so they, I, they allocate, you know, it's so they not total legal depreciation to. with new projects is 500000 a year. Do they then allocate an additional line item to put cash into revenues <coughs> into that account? It's my understanding you cannot have a line item to simply, for purposes of funding a year in surplus. Yeah. Now, there's all sorts of other ways to do that. It wouldn't be a year in surplus because you would actually be expensing it and putting it directly into the reserve account, reserve right? Account. Yeah, you may be able to, to, to fund reserve accounts. I think that's probably right. is legitimate. I suspect communities have done it by, frankly, overstating overlay, uh, raising more mm. money through overlay than is needed yeah. to cover abatements. Uh, you can also understate your revenues. I mean, there's all sorts of other ways to do that. Um, it's not very transparent. It, it's not. Uh, I know back in the day they used to pretty much just pay as you go. Right. Yeah, uh, I remember the stories. Yeah. I remember going to a training and the, and the finance director was talking about how their debt budget was five million and and I was thinking that was like us you know oh our debt budget is five million well that was their total outstanding debt back then so it was kind of like oh that's a big difference from remember, what we're doing. Ruth has 40 years of history so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's probably about 20 dec that. two yeah. decades ago hmm. but yeah so they've right. they it was amazing I think they've also been uh, quite strategic in establishment of, of TIF districts. Uh, all those improvements on that Route 1 corridor have been done through, uh, through the creation of a TIF district years ago that had been accumulating funds, and uh, it's, a, I think, a 12 or $14 million investment they made. I don't think they had that all in reserve. I think they're using TIF revenues to pay off the debt service. So they've, I think they've been strategic in that regard. South Portland is a similar case in use of TIF monies. So can, can you put it as a to-do maybe um, to determine if, um, I don't know if it's through um, Ms. Mueller, um, our bond council, mm -hmm. um, if any portion of that TIF can be designated into a reserve fund such as this for equipment, since, it's, since that equipment would presumably could be used to support the economic development and the maintenance and the upkeep of that particular district. I mean, as we are in our next workshop, we're going to be having a conversation yep. about where is some of that going to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll find out, and she'll be prepared to respond yeah. uh, that evening. Um, I was using that example on the uh, capital roadway improvements, which I, right. I, I think is a different animal. You, you yeah, have it's to get a different a, animal. Than you'd have to get it qualified as a legitimate project through the uh, DCD. Um, but that's a question Shauna will be able to answer for you next week. Well, because, I mean, logically thinking it through, the project, even though it'll take it to, you know, whatever long it's going to be, it's going to require new public safety equipment, um, new public works equipment, all items that can be funded, I would think, through the tip, even though it's like operational. Yeah, the simplistic so, answer I can give you yeah. is, uh, you know, if a development comes into town and it has this unique demand on the public safety, the fire system, they need to buy a ladder truck to be able to properly serve it. Mm -hmm. right. That's that can be legitimately funded for right. TIF purposes. So, but you know, equipment that runs all over town and services beyond the district yeah. and isn't necessarily sure. created because of the district gets a little. And it's dicey. not dedicated solely to the district. Exactly, yeah. that's the challenge. So I'll talk to Shauna, and I'm sure she can answer that. Just, uh, yeah. Good. So I guess that leaves me with some thoughts on, on how you would like to proceed with this 
I mean, I can put a policy together, but it's... Yeah, I mean, I think, I apologize for being late. I got kind of hung up at work. Um, actually, this was, I think, just as kind of an agenda item as a follow-up on some of our, you know, debt policy work, right. where there was this clause in here about the equipment reserve. So I think this is great work. It kind of gives us a framework to say, if we were to do something, this is what it could look like. And I guess I'll defer to this group. I think our thought was, is this something we want to do? Do we want to make our recommendation in the upcoming budget season? Is this something we want to start doing? Is this not the right time? So I, I don't know thoughts of both of you on it. So one of the, uh, Peter, one of the items I had asked for was that um, given the five-year total um, <coughs> equipment budget, which was $6.4 million on page one, yeah. Um, I did ask if they could follow up and try to determine that during that same five-year period, what is the total amount of depreciation related to those projects? Because as we had a conversation with one citizen, it was maybe the starting point of the policy is to um, reserve that much money uh, or some portion thereof. The depreciation. The, the depreciation yeah. amount. And let's see what that is. And I, I believe during the budget process, um, the manager and the director both gave presentations that included those policy um, assumptions and said that um, here is everything that you wanted, including these assumptions. If you don't do these assumptions, then that here's what happens next. If you don't do those, then here's like, you know, if I remember kind of, the, so I'd like to see us do the same thing, because we started that with um, short-term capital projects that were not, that were gonna be funded in the operating budget based on the policy. So I think we treat it the same way that we did with that. I think that would be a good presentation piece in the budget. The other thing we've been trying to do, you know, the school has migrated over I believe, school buses purchases? No, I guess we've kind of, that's been flopped back and forth, but uh, we have uh, cruisers that are now built into the operating budget. Uh, this past year, you chose to fund the residential reval with appropriations as opposed to finding some other method. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've, when the opportunity presents itself, we're trying to find alternatives to financing. And actually those monies, because we're not gonna need a reval in 2020, correct? So those funds right. that are budgeted in 2019, which were appropriated, can now be used in 2020 to help with with some of this. Some of those items that we would normally have maybe bonded, we could actually use those funds instead towards. I'd love it to take the sting out of any increase elsewhere in the budget. Uh, that's 300,000 we won't have to spend again. But Ruth's point's well taken. We structurally built it into the budget. The, the hard part's done. Um, mm -hmm. We could, rather than consuming that for other purposes, we could, that's a chunk of money that's already built in that could be designated theoretically to start funding this on a consistent year-over-year -year basis. The, the only other concern is that according to the, the new financial and fiscal policy that was adopted in September of 2018, mm -hmm. it does have one clause that says complete financing of the reserve equipment reserve fund will be accomplished within six years from the date of this policy. So that kind of gives us a time frame to... And when was that originally? I don't what, what was the original date of the policy? 2018. 18. Oh, 18. Well, so, we well just that's, did that's the update. So we've so yeah. been five or seven years with that okay. similar requirement yes. and never funded yeah, it. So I, we're, we're hitting the reboot button. Uh, as far as we're concerned, <laughs> this we've starts got us over. six years from, from now. Remember time you're in 20, and it does. I heard we just fell into the start this. And that would, well, that was, I think that was one of my other uses for that. Don't say that too loud. So I guess I'm looking for this committee to say is it, it's in what we just wanted to address is this something we should pursue is it a good sound policy that we should work toward and just looking for a recommendation from us to go back to the full council that this is something we think is worth further staff work to answer some of the questions mm -hmm. but come up with sort of a, a game plan to move forward i agree with it, to move forward with it yeah I, I do too i guess uh, now that i understand what you've put on paper here, uh, where the big dispute that you have with yourself is, do I bond it or do I have a reserve fund that accumulates over time to pay for the item uh, so that I can keep my debt down? Yeah. Uh, almost all of our bond monies go to capital equipment, things that have depreciable lives, which takes us to Sean's point, that you can look at the depreciation schedule and see what the useful life of an item is and how much money you're going to lose. And if you're trying to allocate some or all of whatever that number is in a some sort of reserve fund, you'd have enough to replace the equipment. 
and looks like 90% of all the money that we bonded was either vehicles or equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so then once you get that, you, yes, you can set it aside. You have to say, okay, you're taxing people who don't get any use for it <coughs> because it's only once you buy the item that you've now used the reserve fund uh, and then they, the new people in town get a free ride. And I've always been back and forth on that. I go, well, when bond, when, when bond interest rates are incredibly low, it seems like the appropriate, really the appropriate thing to do. When bond rates are going up, and so you might be a little more reluctant uh, to, to go in that direction and start to uh, have reserve funds. Uh, if we're in stressful times, I guess I'd say, well, bond it, because it pushes obligations off. But I don't think we're necessarily going to be in stressful times. I, I get the impression that we're going to have an improving municipal budget, uh, and therefore having some money, some allocation of a reserve fund is probably a good idea. I'm not sure it would be 100% of the depreciation, which would essentially fund 100% of the replacement. But I would like to see us maybe attempt to, and we're a town that has so many new buildings because we've had so many new people that we've, we've built up a lot of debt because we have a lot of capital expenditures. So maybe we're at a point now where we ought to try and make sure that starts to come down. And I, I, Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I would think because we have some of our major building construction projects that are here and perhaps potentially coming in the future, the, the, the goal of trying to fund some of these equipment purchases elsewhere or mm -hmm. not through bonds allows us to provide that money for bonds towards those bigger purchases mm -hmm. or projects. So um, to your question, I would, I, would, I would hope that or ask, encourage, whatever you want to use, um, that staff come up with a, pol a starting policy. Um, I, I prefer a building block approach to that um, and not starting by building something very big and then having to take things away because we can't meet those. Um, to the Councillor uh, Donovan's point, um, there is a third piece that isn't, because actually if you look at the funding sources for the bonds that are on the very first page in the green chart, um, to me that first building block maybe in part not to start is to at least cover the portion of the amount that's being appropriated by property taxes, because all the other sources are reserve accounts, they're just different reserve accounts. So, uh, you know, maybe the, the, I think the goal, I think it's a laudable goal to eventually get where 100% of it comes out of this equipment reserve account and you're not going into the pain road impact fee account, the rescue equipment, you know what I'm saying? Because um, those can be used for other purposes, but I think a good starting point is to at least let's see, you know, mm -hmm. What portions? Because then we can take it away from the property tax. A point worth making, nowhere shown on this are kind of the bricks and mortar investments, which are the big dollars. Right. These are the voter approved monies uh, to, for facilities, and they aren't here because they're, they're kind of outside, they are voter approved. But those are the ones that are really, have put that debt load where it is and will keep it where it is. Um, this is about managing all those other incidental right. things that come in year in and year out. Okay. And maybe just to add <clears throat> to what Councilor Baybine, you know, requested, I think is a great suggestion. And whether if it does say six years, kind of keep that in mind. What would it take for us to kind of get there in six years? What does that look like? Um, and I think the bigger question, the reason this was just on the agenda to say, you know, I think we had this conversation when we did the policy. If this is something we're not committed to, then we should go back and kind of amend the policy. Yeah. If it's something we are committed to, mm -hmm. then we should try to live up to what the policy says and at least see what that looks like. So it sounds like you're supportive. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I think that um, one thing to keep into consideration is that we are going through a transition in, the, in three weeks, well, yeah. five weeks. So I hope that we are, we being the committee, are strong enough to recommend to the next committee and, and any new members that um, these type of issues and policies should be fluid. Um, and be able to transfer from one committee to the next without having ideological challenges. Um, 
he does this for the betterment of the community as a whole. But I think it's a great start. This is good information. Yeah, yeah. the intent is to put in structural yeah. systems that yeah. survive over right. time, long yeah. periods of yeah. time. That's the only way we're going to be able to Credit ratings don't care who sits behind this desk. They, they do care about these policies that we put in place. Mm -hmm. And the transition idea is again, yeah. they'll, they'll very well could be different members. We're sitting here, Councilor Cazzo is not going to be sitting here. Right? So we're going to have different members. We'll and having a, a bit of uh, a, a communication with those new members to get them up to speed come December would be a good idea. I think we'll be fine myself. But yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Great work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Financial modeling? Yeah. We'd like to share some initial thoughts and, and get some reaction so before we take kind of the next step. Um, so Larissa's going to lead us through that. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to kind of walk us through what are we doing here and, and help us maybe answer some questions about what and why, and then once that has been answered, how. This is a separate piece, so if we can wait to speak to that for just a few moments. Um, sorry, we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> So what does a long-term financial plan need? So it's not just about forecasting for one year out what do we think our revenues are going to be, what our expenditures are going to be. So what is a long-term financial plan? Because I think that that's what we've been talking about when we've been talking about forecasting and financial planning. I think that we, we want to be looking three years, five years, ten years out. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be technically sound. We need to have space and time and staff resources being allocated for this to do um, really good fiscal environment analysis. So looking outside of directly in the town of Scarborough, um, things like if we were doing this in the past, we would have been watching what's happening with revenue sharing, what's happening with school funding. Those are outside of the town of Scarborough's control, but they're absolutely impacting our fiscal environment. Um, currently, we would want to be looking at population estimates and service requirement estimates, and those are all part of our fiscal environment. We also need to be technically sound on revenue and expenditure projections, so we'd need to come to a really set methodology about how we're going to make those predictions and um, projections. And then, a, a, you know, a, a thorough debt analysis. What is our current debt situation? What is our capacity for debt? And how are we working through that? It needs to be participative and collaborative. So I think that it, it can't be done just by staff. It can't be done just with the Finance Committee. I think it really should be an opportunity for us to connect with a larger public and have um, opportunity to hear from the public what they are wanting to see in a in financial forecasting, what, what do they see as its value, um, and yes, that's pretty, okay. And then there has to be policies in place that are driving it. So we have a lot of great policies in place, so this is kind of an, in general, what does it need? I think we've done a lot of great work there, um, but some of those policies also, you know, we might open up discussion about where do we want to see service levels and where do we want to have prioritization when it comes to program delivery and program development. And that really needs to be a policy sort of discussion at a larger level so that it's not um, each year coming in and fighting for one program, that there's a, there's a set of goals or policies that, that the council is wanting to reach and, and the programs are helping to meet those, those policies and goals. Financial planning needs to be tightly connected with our budget process. The, you know, if, if there's a financial plan that's been adopted by council, then the budget process should really tie into that because they can't be in conflict with one another. If the long-term financial plan that's adopted by council says, you know, we're going to, um, you know, we've got, we're going to aim to have our expenditures, you know, be within these ranges over time, and that's what we think is going to need to happen in order for us to meet these long-term financial goals. Well, then the budget process each year needs to reflect that longer range plan. And then, but ultimately, it also needs to be a very flexible plan. You know, if, if we had developed a long range financial plan in 2006, we would have been, we would have needed to be able to be flexible in 2008, 9, and 10 to adjust our expectations and to realign our resources to, to better meet the needs of, of that time period and the environment that was created by the Great Recession. So, what does it look like to build one? So right now, if you guys were to say, yep, we are all on board, we, we want long-term financial planning, absolutely. Well, then we would be in, and we're kind of using GFOA, so just a wealth of wonderful information. And um, Shane Kavanaugh is one of their primary um, 
authors and kind of brains of the organization. And I have really been enjoying his Financing the Future Long-Term Financial Planning for Local Government book. And I've had the great opportunity to meet him, as has Ruth. He's, a, he's just a great, he's good resources. So, um, so these fancy words, I'm stealing them from Shane. So mobilization, and that's where we would find ourselves now. So preliminary financial analysis, that's that environmental issue scan. So that would, you know, staff would look across the state. And I think that for our town, it makes sense to be looking across the state. We're not a national player. It's not like we are one of the, we don't have a, we're not a Texas instrument hub, right, that is going to be impacted by national forces as much. We're, but we certainly should be looking around the state of Maine, maybe even New England to some extent. Um, Revenue expenditure forecasts started to play with that a little bit. You've got that in your packet. And I happen to have um, a debt analysis that's been started, again, inspired by the fan folks at GFOA. Um, so we've got some of that work ready to be expanded on. The self-service, the service level preferences and policies, that's part of a larger conversation with council, certainly. Um, and that's part of that first phase because really we need to know why? Why are we funding? And that means what are we funding? And what level of service are we looking to fund? Um, we've done a great review recently of our existing financial policies. I think we're in a really good position there. The biggest hurdle, I think, right out of the gate is agreeing on the purpose of this exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, what, why are we doing this? And, and then defining the scope of it. Is this a five-year plan? Is this a 10-year plan? Is this just operational? Does this also bring in that, um, that capital buildings piece, our, our kind of our master plan of, of buildings and capital improvements, not just of equipment, but of facilities. So defining the scope. Then we would move into, once all of those things are set, we all are on the same page, we're agreeing, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is how much we're doing, then staff would go into the analysis. So that's gathering up all the information that we would need, working on those trend projections. Luckily, we do have a lot of data already just assembled already that looks past back 11 years at this point. So we've got a lot of trends able to be worked with. Um, and then kind of some financial balance analysis. Where Where is the balance between, ex, between building for services tomorrow, between protecting tax rates, between expenditures and, and revenues and, and finding those balances? Once the plan is written, and that would be months away, this is not a, a week-long project, this is, this is going to take some time, then it would go before council and council would have to decide if they wanted to adopt that plan. And if council decided they were going to adopt the plan at that point, it would come back to staff to be charged with implementing the plan as it was established. Okay, so that's the process of this. Great. We already have some other plans that would intersect and inform the financial plan. Our comprehensive plan certainly tells us what the priorities are from a large point of view for the community. Um, we do have a capital improvement plan. We sh you see that every year in your budget book. You've got that five-year CIP model. Um, and then our annual budget is a plan. You know, it's an it's a annual plan of how we're going to meet the priorities of the, of the council at the time. So I included in your packet, um, I don't know if anyone had a chance to go check these people out, but um, San Clemente, California has been doing long-term financial planning since 1993. I love their plan. It's so easy. It's easy to read. It's, it flows really well. It's logical. I think if you decide that this is a direction that you want to go in, I certainly would be reaching out to the people in San Clemente and, and asking them, how did you guys get started? What does this look like to get off the ground? I think that they are the right size community. They're larger than us. Everyone else in this country is larger than the communities in Maine. But they're considered a small community. They've got, I think, about 65,000. And so in the general US population of states, that's a small a small place. Um, but they're just, they're solid. Their plans are, their plans are solid. And they're, I think that they're really user friendly for the public to understand. Um, and their, their process is really solid as well. They've got space for public engagement and public input into the plan. They update it every year as um, part of their pre-budget cycle. And they bring in, the after they've had the public input, then they're having the counselors, of course, coming into the conversation as well. I think they're a great model. So if you're interested in us pursuing this, I would really encourage you to check out for yourself, see if you agree that this is a tight model to be following, um, and just know that this is kind of where I'd, I would want to be going with it. So tonight, if, if we can, <laughs> um, these are the questions I think are really important to answer before we go any further, which is, is this a project that we want to do? 
um, because it is going to take time and resources and, and effort. And, um, and I would want you, and tonight I guess we can't answer this, but I would want you to look at San Clemente's model and say yes or no to that being a, a model that you think would meet the needs if this is the direction you want to head in. And then a larger kind of question of why? What is the purpose of this? Because if we're not really clear on the purpose, then it's really hard to sustain the energy that's going to be required to get us through to the end and to have the buy-in of the finished product if we do get to the end. So I think being very clear on what is the purpose of this up front and making sure that everyone's on board with that shared purpose is going to be imperative if to make this actually successful. And then let's come to agreement on what is a reasonable timeline for this. Um, I don't think it's reasonable to expect for a, a long-range financial plan to be in place prior to this year's budget cycle. I think that that's unreasonable, but we could certainly lay the groundwork, have a, a, a plan in place probably concurrent with the budget process. It's a little clunky to be doing that, but I think it's possible. Um, and then be ready to hit the ground running next fall to update that financial plan for the like for January. So it's ha the the updated financial plan is adopted by council in January prior to budget season starting in for fiscal year 21. Did I haven't read the San Clemente uh, piece, but the first three questions really are the same, the same thing different ways. Uh, uh, whether we want to undertake it, does it meet the council needs, why, why are we doing this? When you read the San Clemente, long-range plan, did you feel like it met those that it was worth doing and it would meet the needs of a municipality, council, generic? Uh, why are we doing this? Because it meets the needs of the, of the community? So I think that, yes, I think the, those three questions are definitely very tightly tied together, but I think that they are all three distinct. I happen to like planning. I just do. Um, so I like to know what are my goals? What am I, you know, how am I going to know if I've achieved those goals? What are the, the, what are the midpoints between that I can say, yep, checked that, met that, moving forward. And I like when government can run that way too. Now, I understand that government is a much more complex system than I am and that there needs to be some... I'm some not so sure of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, I really... I like this project. Okay, this is something that I think does have so you, value. When you read it, you thought it was Absolutely. truly useful. And it's I, the, like saying, that I think reading the comprehensive plan gives me a good sense of where we should be going beyond this year. Yes, and I think it, one of the things I especially like about it is it provides an opportunity for residents to have a role in the financial process of the town that's an appropriate role. It still protects, because I believe in forms of government as well, it still protects very clearly. The council is this legislative body, the council decides on you know, how, what are the priorities, what are we funding, how are we funding, but it gives this process each year gives residents the opportunity to come in and talk about what are those priorities and where do we stand and is our comprehensive plan reflecting our priorities still and it, it opens an opportunity for dialogue. It is also, I think, really dependent on us stepping up our game on surveying. So we, I've, we talked about this before, but when we're trying to decide the level of service that we provide to our residents, we're counting on them being satisfied with their level of service because we don't care that they're not. And I think that that's a fair assumption outside of having actual data, but I think that this model would require us to be collecting data from our residents more regularly. What services are they most pleased with? At what level of service are they pleased? Where do they see places for us to decrease service? Where do they want to see increases in service? Because that data is going to help form this model. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Larissa, do you know how common it is for communities to undertake something as elaborate as San Clemente? Or I do not. Time? Okay, I just didn't. Just you know, maybe, and maybe to, to set the framework and Sean, Chris, and I have probably had this conversation for a couple of years now. So, and actually, it is kind of responding to some of the questions we get from the community. And I think the long range plan can have all of those purposes you just described. I think the shorter term piece we were really trying to solve for is we sat here and thought about we know something has to be done with the primary schools. You know, we knew something had to be done with the public safety building. I think what we're trying to do is there a simple way that we could start to model what our decisions today 
might have on the impact on the tax rate in the next couple of years. Because I think we were trying to determine, geez, with, with the debt service we have, and I think in some of the prior conversations we've had, it's like, okay, there looks like a period of time that if we were going to do a new school, there was kind of a lull in the debt service. That might be a good time to target. So I think that the shorter term answer was, geez, could we do just a three-year sort of snapshot of the decisions we're making today and how we you know, prioritize things and do things? How does that play out over time? So I think there's, there's lots of different answers, but I think this started from a much simpler perspective of, and I was kind of hoping that with all the work we've been doing with the TIF, with the financial models that we have, that some of that legwork might be done. With, I think we've tried to collect what our revenues and what we think expenses are. So I think there's, so I, I guess I'd be curious about, I think it is really important to, to, de, to define the purpose of the exercise. I think it started with just, gee, is there a way most businesses when they budget, at least what I'm familiar with, have a three-year business plan. This is where we think, based on today, we're gonna be in three years, this is what it looks like. So if we have to correct, of course, we can. I think that was one of the original intents, and I'll defer to, to Councilor Bebo on whether that's accurate. I love the bigger picture of what you're talking about. How do we do that more planful strategy? And, and I don't know where you were in your mind, Sean, when you were talking about this. And yeah, um, so if you look at um, Ms. Crockett's uh, um, oh, um, slide, I, I don't remember what page it is, it's, in, it's the mobilization analysis piece. Try to bring that part. I think that under that very first bullet regarding the financial preliminary financial analysis, it's incorporated within that because the debt analysis would take into consideration those projects that I think you're describing on a short term basis that we can look at. Um, even though we do have some uh, revenue and expenditure forecasting, the piece that um, I have a bigger challenge putting my hand around is actually um, the second bullet, and that's identifying service level preferences and policies in which we've never had a conversation on, um, because that is, that is in essence, your, I would think, be a big part of your goal setting, because it's what are the services do you want? And, and it's about what do you want. It's not about, um, let's, all right, let's first talk about the cost of it and then decide what we want. What, what is it that you want? And then let's de determine the prioritization based upon the cost. So we've never had that conversation, even though we talk about goals, and I do think that, um, so, so it's incorporated, I think, as part of the process. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm comfortable, so um, I did get a chance to go on and look. Um, I think this is a great direction that we're moving. Um, I like the layout um, and this process that you walk us through. Um, I think it is worth, I, I actually think the timeline is a little bit longer than maybe a year. I think um, I would rather have this process down packed before we started implementing it. And even if it's after my tenure on the council, um, so be it so long as we're moving it in the right direction because I want to make sure that it works um, at the, and even in the simplest um, kind of projections. Um, and I think that the bigger conversation, so when you get to the questions that you had asked, um, you know, being the first, you know, is this a, is this a project that we want to undertake? Um, I say as a finance committee, we make that recommendation and say yes. Um, the question is whether or not is this something that we want to do simply as a finance committee or is it something that the entire council has to agree to? Uh, because there's a lot of things that we create um, that we then share and then they accept. And so I kind of want to hear uh, from other councils about whether this is something we should undertake as a whole or simply as a group. Um, and then, um, but that goes into what is the purpose of the exercise and how we're going to use it. Um, this committee will definitely use this. Good. I have to question whether the entire council will use it. I, I, you know, and I, I'm not trying to demean any of my co-councils. I have a lot of respect for them. It's just that there is so much undertaken at the council level. Whether this becomes their focus and priority is, is a concern uh, for the amount of effort and the amount of time and resources that it takes. Um, and then the, the, the bigger part is, um, I just had a, um, a brain tease. I am so sorry. I've had a very long day on campaign forms. What was the other item? I apologize, I apologize. Oh, it gets back into kind of, um, it's, it's the concept around, um, you know, identify, identifying the policies and the programs. It's also identifying the goals because, I mean, in, in policy governance, which is what we kind of uh, work under, um, you, you set a goal and it really should transform um, and transfer from council to council because your goals shouldn't really be different. The goal is we want a better community. 
you might have different measures um, to look at to determine whether or not that goal is being met. And I think that this type of process and this type of modeling will allow the goal to stay consistent from council to council, but yet the measures from council to council might take a different look over time as long as it's available and there's not a strong, you know, um, because it becomes, you know, a benchmark that you use. So I, I like this. I think it's incorporated in your comments for what we've talked about. I think it's incorporated in the design um, that Larissa has talked about. So um, I don't think that we would, we would lose that. Uh, but I think if I'm hearing you right, Peter, I think you might want some urgency or some immediacy regarding the projections around the master planning and some of the projects rather than waiting for this to come out. So whether that becomes part of next year's budget or not, I think that's a, I think that could be a separate conversation. But I, but I like this long-term kind of view of what we want to do. Because eventually once this is done, it'll become every year, it'll become part of a regular process. And so how do we get from here to that point? It's just like the dashboard metrics. It becomes, yeah. it becomes a tool. That I mean, look how long it took us to create, you know, one page of dashboard, dashboard metrics, which is very insightful. Um, and just imagine what this is going to create. Um, it's, it's significantly greater, and it took us, just as a committee, three years to come yeah. up with an agreement amongst us what we wanted, and one year for a very talented assistant manager to do it, and, and other stuff. Yeah, thank you. I'm a little confused. I think I'm hearing different things, and correct me if I'm wrong. Sean, I hear you kind of really buying into this big picture, kind of all in, mm -hmm. with some realistic expectations of timeline. And Peter, maybe you're, I think you said you're equally interested, but you're more interested in the near term on kind of a, a three-year window. Um, start start smaller. But I think you were using that as an example. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. That's just that's what business does, is you, you weren't saying, let's adopt that model because we don't know what that model is. I didn't take his remarks to mean that. Yeah, I mean, I think where I was is, I, I love this model, and I think yeah. this is great. Um, a sidebar is, yeah, I think we probably should do a proposal to, to I, I agree with you about the rest of the council members to get their buy-in, because it will take resources. Yeah. To the extent, though, as we start down this pathway, I think we are facing, you know, any information we could have some of the decisions we're making now and what does that do on the current service levels and what we're looking at. Because if we find, you know, geez, with, with the reappraisal that's coming, the revaluation, maybe there's some room in the budget so we can do some things in next year's budget that we want to do. It's just a tool. Mm -hmm. Not say in place of. We're just saying I think that's an important, as much as we can get, even just a, you know, rough estimate would be helpful. So, so I think that those two things can actually absolutely happen concurrently and separately. I think that that's, that's fine. Um, I would want to hear kind of as a group exactly what you want to see in those that shorter range. All right, so what you have in your packet, you've got this, um, I'm sorry about the font size. I'm so sorry. I know it's, it's very small. I should have provided magnifying glasses as well. But I tried to isolate out, um, when we're talking about revenues, you know, just looking at the total revenue is not all that helpful because we have property tax as our major form of revenue, and we are fortunate to live in a community, uh, I don't know how to say this, that's not going to just, but many communities worry about their property tax collection rate, right? We don't have that concern here. We are very fortunate to live in a community that, for the by and large, people pay their property taxes. We don't run about Right. So we don't have this. So our fluctuations in property tax revenue is not really of a concern because we have a consistent, really high percentage of collection. Mm -hmm. What is of interest in my eyes, as far as looking at projections and, and thinking about where have we been, where can we reasonably estimate will be going forward, is those non-property tax revenues. And those include excise and other taxes, licenses and permits, intergovernmental revenue, so that's going to be your um, revenue sharing, your state aid to education, those sort of revenues, interest earned, basically very little at this point, um, and thinking about how those have changed over time. So this very rough, very basic, probably not useful in all that many ways model that I've, I've built for you on this page is looking at those um, non-property tax revenues and looking at them historically figuring out their average percent change. And then I've, you've got a column there that says more likely percent change. 
And if you'll just kind of um, forgive me for taking license there. So when we looked historically, for instance, at, um, at interest earned, okay, it showed a drop of a negative 8%, basically, of interest earned over that time period. Well, interest rates are going up. So I said, well, a more likely short-range estimate for what we might expect interest to be would be, I suggested, a 0.5% increase over time. Okay, so that's factored into the model. Mm -hmm. But that's all subjective, and that's one of the challenges with this sort of exercise is that we'd have to agree on my assumptions or you'd have to give me assumptions you'd rather use. Um, governmental um, things are the same. So it shows that the average percent change over time in intergovernmental was a negative 3.86%. Well, we're minimal receivers now. So there won't be any other. So I've said, actually, I think a more reasonable is a 1% increase annually over time. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing because our, our state ed education is tied to a percentage of our total special education budget, and it will increase because our special education has, budget has increased, and that's, of course, no way to get ahead to get back a percentage of your ever-increasing cost, right? Um, so anyway, so when you're looking at this, and, and then I also... Goes up. I'm sorry? Unless funding goes up. Right, right. Until, unless that total pie gets bigger, it's a little harder. And then I have a, on the far right-hand column a weighted percent change. So I took the total amount of each of those revenues and I weighted them against what I consider to be the more likely percent change. And so those are the assumptions that are fueling when you look down here in, at the bottom set of figures, your 10-year financial forecast. I've given you an estimated total general fund revenue. I've given you that estimated non-property tax, non-debt related revenues, which I think is actually the more telling of those pieces, and then the estimated budgeted expenditures. Um, and the budgeted expenditures, I, for assumptions, um, I give you your assumptions for analysis. Um, I'm assuming an annual change in budgeted expenditure of 3.348%, and that's based on historical data. And, and again, those are all going, there's going to be some people in the room that are like, that's not enough, and, and, and so it just gets really tricky does, in, this, in this vacuum. But, it, but it, again, it, it, this isn't, I mean, everybody's got to go into it with the experts. This is just our best guess. And there's things that, but it's, it's better than what we've had in the past. It's just a tool. Um, so, I, 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 you know, the, the piece missing from this would be then, you know, the bigger piece becomes and what do we think is going to happen to real estate value? And what does that do to the, well, what we need for funding? Right, so I did, I purposely, and we had, I think, a conversation via email a few months ago about this. I purposely did not yeah, include yeah. the assessed value piece estimate. A couple of reasons why. One, we were in the middle of, of revaluations. I, I, I totally understand. And so I didn't wish to add speculation on top of speculation because that just mm -hmm. makes yeah. me uncomfortable. Um, and because, I'll be very honest, I was very concerned about putting out in print an estimate of assessed value with an estimate of expenditure and an estimate of revenue and having people do quick math and coming up with estimated tax rates that were going to look really scary and not having any sort of opportunity to say, look, we, we don't know because we don't know what some of these other pieces that aren't modeled in here are going to be on that tax rate computation sheet. These are basic numbers that we can use to come up with some some there was no place to put ranges in here. And so th for me, that was uncomfortable to do, which is why they're not shown there. Um, but you're right. That is a really important big Absolutely. piece. Yeah. Where, what is that assessed value going to do? Just keep in mind, on an annual basis, our budget is our best guess of what's going to happen in the True. next 12 months. And we should have greater clarity than this analysis. And the, the elusive tax rate estimate is um, challenging even on that limited basis. So it, it gets ex exponentially more elusive the further we go out. It's not to say we shouldn't do it, but we need to know no, what it is. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, most, so anyway, that, that was the basis for the conversation. So um, if I, what I think we do have consensus on is the bigger, longer range mm -hmm. proposal. It sounds like we're comfortable with that. Would it be helpful for me to print out the most recent copy of the San Clemente proposed the San Clemente plan, one for each counselor, so they have a physical copy to physically read instead of trying to read it on their computers? Would that be useful? 
Yeah, do both. I mean, because I mean, what, one of the one of the arguments that have been made over time, even just in our regular budget process, or uh, not even over time, more recently, is the um, accessibility to the information through technology and how complicated that can be. And I think that for at least the counselors to start that conversation, if they go online and see that program, they can then understand the fluidity of it and the easy access to it, um, while still having maybe you know the hard copy. A lot of people like hard copy. I'm a hard copy guy, but then I go online. Um, it was very easy to navigate. Okay. Is it worthwhile to put a link somewhere that they could yes. refer to? Yeah. yeah, I think the link's part of the presentation. Yeah. And then, so that, so I think that's, we have consensus on that. that? I think so, for the committee. Yeah. And then, and then I think maybe just for purposes of the next finance, finance committee, that there's another meeting in November, right? Maybe you know at least take a, a rough stab for not maybe just handing out what's coming back um, <laughs> on, on what that might look like because I think that one of the goals was just to look at gee, so even though in that example if we take a look at the next three or four years and we see a time when the tax rate might dip presumably on best guesses that might be a time we target if that's a good year to invest in whatever we invest in. Are you comfortable with the assumptions for on the sheet that you have in front of you with the extremely small print? Yeah. Are you comfortable with the assumptions that I've made in the forecast that I've given to you for revenues and expenditures? I mean, I think for something like that, we'll be, you'll have to work with each finance committee, and for the most part, we're going to take your your best guess about what your informed guess about what it is. But for yeah. this finance committee, yeah. for yes. next for yeah. November, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. For do you feel comfortable with the more yes. likely percent changes that yes. I've? Yep. I've worked up yep. and important. weighting them the way that I've weighted them and the um, budgeted expenditures at that 3.348. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'd, I would I'd like to see every one of them have a footnote that then explains the basis for the uh, assumption. assumption. I mean, that I'm looking at it, I, can, I cannot read it. I'm sorry, Bill. I know. I mean, I cannot read it, and I uh, and then I go over to the more likely percentage change, and I have no clue. You can't get from the left hand column to the right hand column, uh, and so I would like to be able to say I buy into this, but I'm sitting here thinking I have no clue okay. whether I buy into. Well, this uh, is a working document, and we're sharing it with you just to say this is kind so of. Rough, rough. We, where we started, are we heading in the right direction? So some sort of narrative to accompany the assumptions, better format with at least a 12-point font. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I firmly believe we're not supposed to release things with less than a 12-point font. It's not thoughtful. Um, so a narrative to accompany the assumptions to help break that down so it's easy. It's so, yeah. so instead of me saying to you, well, I know historically that we've seen an 8% decrease in our interest, but I'm thinking insurance rates are going up. I think that in our next few years, it's more likely to say a 0.5% increase. And what you've done is you've taken real numbers from 2007 to 2017 in the top bunch of lines, mm -hmm. and then used the more likely percent change for the bottom section, which is 2020, 2029. And then I did list out assumptions for analysis in that middle point, but I can certainly see where our narrative would be helpful. And I can see why you would focus on the 2020 through 2029, because I, if you tell me that this the 20 through 29 are based on 2007 through 2017, with these assumptions coming about, I don't need to see 2007 through 2017. Okay. I mean, it would terribly simplify the presentation of data. You all comfortable with that? No. Okay. So um, I'm comfortable. I don't think you need to show a forecast up to 2029. Yeah. We're just getting this started. I think if you go yes. out a three-year cycle, I think that's more than sufficient. Yeah. yeah. Once we have um, kind of, I think, um, solidified or agreed to um, the framework of the other long term, then we can start going out further. Okay. Because I think that we'll... Um, be much more knowledgeable and better at doing this. The other piece is that I also don't think you need to go back more than three years or five years. Um, 
personally, and this is a personal, it's just I think that um, in business we don't go back 10 years and look at what the performance of a bank or the performance of the company was 10 years ago. Um, generally it's a three year scope um, at the most, um, if not maybe one or two. So typically that they do that, I think people expect that because they use it to the, the discussion that they're trying to emphasize because of the cycle. I think the majority of people who look at financial statements and understand them, they know that cycles happen and that there's going to be bumps and curves and peaks and valleys and everything else. So I, I say shorten this to maybe the last three years to be comfortable and then the next three years until we've gotten through the process and solidified everything. Because uh, otherwise you're going to, it's, I mean, it's great information. It, don't get me wrong, it's a lot, because I know it's a lot of work. Um, I just think that that would be I agree. an easier kind of out of the gate. I think at least that way we can focus on a more limited scope of data. Okay. Would, would you like us to finish the analysis that would include a projection of yeah. uh, value and obviously tax rate? Yeah, so the, so the one thing I wanted to ask Peter, because um, and, and I don't want to, um, what I call dumb this down, I, when, when you're talking about forecasting, um, are you looking for an income statement um, or expense report? Uh, not the fund balance, but um, I forgot in governmental, what's it called? The expenditures report. Are you looking for that report and then have three years forecast a line item? No. You're not, you're, you are looking just for this level? I think so. I mean, okay. I mean, my thought would be, and, and Tom and I had this conversation <coughs> in different contexts, but I, and I agree, Let's let, this is just a working document. It's a start, sort of like our metrics that we said. We're just going to, we're going to put them out there. It's a work in progress. We're going to adjust mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. What we really should be doing, if we did the three years, we should go back then in each year, kind of look back and say, how close were we? Absolutely. You know, to absolutely. amend the model. What, what did we miss? Yeah. You know, what, 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 yeah, why? Yeah, and, and so we can keep refining it so that you know we're not stuck to this 10-year projection. But, you well, know, because you have to change your assumptions going forward. because you, you know, things, And that's where the cycle piece comes into it. The, the reason why I'm asking that is that um, for some reason I have this inner feeling that there are going to be people out there um, that um, will have a very different or very higher level of expectations in the amount of details that we have in this forecast because they want to know what is going to be spent on police, what's going to be spent on at least on a departmental basis where this is aggregated. Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't, whatever we create, we only create the wheel once and that it's round and it works and not create a wheel that's square and we have to change it because you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to say it in the right way. <laughs> well, quite a, that's a great question. So in order for you to build this, do you actually have that line item, item detail somewhere? Or is that how you got to it? So yes, we do have that line item detail. I used the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Most of this comes off of Statement 4. So those are aggregate mm -hmm. numbers more so. I would be willing to, because I do what you ask me to, to do so at a more line item level, but I don't know how much value there is to be gained from that. Yeah, I, wasn't, I mean, no, I, was trying, I, was trying. I think there is value to some extent of doing public safety is one unit, education is one unit. I don't want us to be looking at what is each level of education, what is each level within public safety for, for planning purposes, I think. Here's public safety. There is value to that. Uh, personally, I don't necessarily need it, but I have a feeling that there's going to be citizens that would prefer to see that. That's, that's the on. hybrid approach, and off that schedule, yeah. there, they, there's public services, public safety, right. five public work. So there's like five or six broad yeah. categories. There's a lot of detail rolled up into those. And that's sort of what I was thinking to kind of build on where Sean was that this is just a working model to begin with. We're starting at the 30,000 mile level. If after a year or two we think we get it dialed down, people want that level of detail, like to. And, and, and we've got the building blocks underneath it, I don't think it makes sense to start there because we don't even know how accurate it is. Oh, yeah. But but if we if, if we dial this down and we get to a point where we're pretty comfortable with it, then we can start sharing more detail on it, some okay. of that stuff. It's really, but I think out of the box, we just want a benchmark. Where are we? And, and where do we think we're going? And is that an issue? Do we have room in the budget to add services? Are we facing a cliff? I'm not saying that we are, but if we are, what do we need to do? I mean, it's more of a planning. Yep. And I think this is a short term, it's great work. I think it gives us, it, it's something we, we can respond to our, our folks saying, yeah, we, we said we're going to do this, so there, here's our start. 
We'll get feedback. We will. So for Not November, uh, what I'm hearing is let's have a better format that's more readable um, with narratives to accompany the assumptions. We're going to end at 2022, so just 2020, 2021, 2022 for fiscal years. Um, I'm only I'm going to rework the numbers. I'm a little wary of this, but I'm, I'm willing to believe I'm going to work rework the numbers only looking from 2015 to 2017. Because mm -hmm. remember, these are all using audited data, so I don't have access mm -hmm. to FY18 yet, so we, we can't pull that in. Um, and I'm going to include my best guess based on where we have from our assessing office what we think we currently are at for um, assessed value residential. I'm going to, so I'm going to speculate on top of speculation, but I'll include narrative to explain why. Um, and Are then, you if you're more comfortable? <laughs> um, and then I will give and I'll give you a tax rate estimate, but with some like probably like six caveats yeah. underneath. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. What assumptions regarding debt? Is that can be the tail that wags the dog? If if I mean, uh, well, I mean, I think I think build in whatever's in the budget. You know, we look yep. ahead for the five years. Sure. Build that in. Because yep. that's what we're that's talking known. about. That's okay. known. And then I think the beauty of the model might be then if we say, geez, if we needed to add a big ticket item, what does that do? So can I use though historical levels of debt service? Like we know what we know what our ex expected debt service is for the next year based like on current debt held. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. using a you know an average of what additional debt service comes on each year plus the amortization charts that we have that tell us what we yeah, know we, we have to pay. We've modeled that. I mean, yeah, we've got those models. 20 years based on, you know, right. four and six million dollars of right. additional debt every year yeah. just to fund our capital plan. So I can show you, so may, could, maybe the ranges could be in part informed by, because we do have that model at two million, four million, and six million. So um, maybe that could be, are you comfortable with that kind of coming in? Because that is going to make a big yeah. difference about whether or not the council moving forward chooses to appropriate or bond things like plow trucks. Yeah, what, what I was referring to is those big ticket things that would be voter approved. It would be funding a brand new school. Or right, but I, but I think as we had talked about it, part of this exercise is to figure out when would be the optimal time, if any. So don't include any possible large capital projects within this model because we're using the model to identify where there's space. I think we've got some better something. tools. Uh, we know what those amortization schedules, we know, we know when we're shedding debt and we have a carve out and an opportunity um, in, in far better detail through our debt analysis than this will yeah. indicate. And we do have the five year capital plan. What we haven't put on that five year plan is how we're going to fund those future years if they're going to be impact fees or bonds <coughs> or appropriations. All we've done in our budget, 2019 budget, is that in 2020, these are the items that might be coming right. forward, 2021. So if we just put some whether we're going to bond or appropriate yeah. them, then that would give us something to work yeah. towards. I mean, this is just, this is not, no one's going to hold, hold any of us accountable for using. It's just, it's the, the first sort of step of saying, is there a way we can start getting a snapshot of what the next couple, couple of years look like? Is there any consequence to using uh, uh, 2017 as the last fiscal year for data because it's the last audited year, as opposed to uh, moving it up a year? use uh, 16, 17, and 18, because 18 ended four months ago, and uh, we have a pretty damn good idea of what that looks like. I would really Not prefer... Notwithstanding that it... I mean, we don't find that kind of change from audited versus unaudited. Mm. I don't like it, Bill. I, if, if you're will, So we'll have that audit completed By in December. 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 So January's meeting, I can come to you just with audited see, data. that's what I was thinking. That's if you want to wait till January. It's just a timing issue. But I don't want to do that with unaudited no, data. We can do this with the audited, and then when we get better information, we'll add that year in. Yeah, so I just didn't know how much of a fix. consequence moving up a year. It's the most recent data. Makes me very uncomfortable, Bill. Don't wish to do that. Well, well, the well if, the, if it was, if there were <laughs> dramatic differences, I'd be uncomfortable too. But there aren't. Well, I. We've had issues. I, with we'd that. rather use audited so, figures if we could. I, I think, for purposes of November, just this sort of the first peak. It may be all oh, this. This is great, or it might be. Yeah. 
Okay. You know, let's, let's go back the, to the drawing board and see what we get. One other thing that maybe you could do, and I don't know how the citizens or folks would like it, but if we were to look at that first line for 2017, it says $6,282,429, which is a uh, excise and other taxes. I mean, we could put all of this, these numbers in, in terms of $1,000. So instead of showing the 6, yes. comma, 282, comma, we could just put 6 million, six, it would say 6,282, knowing that there's three, yep. di three yes. other digits yes. there. Would shorten it, make it a little bit easier to read yes. maybe, but I don't know if folks totally would say, right. oh, look, it's only $4 no. instead of, you know. So just, put, just indicate um, thousands. What I wanted in to thousands, mention that's the word. was um, I agree with Larissa um, as far as using audited versus unaudited. I think, though, that during this development stage, as long as it's only used for conversation purposes, is that if we could see it with the 17, I'm sorry, the 18, 18 numbers, and then we just simply won't present it or finalize this until the audited, because it's about, because then it will become Time part budget. of the regular budget cycle, just so that we can see. Because um, then you'll just need to, you'll just need to put that in there later. And it's, it's purely for the conversation of the design, how it looks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's up to you guys. Do it's, we have, it's minor to me. So. Do we have? So I don't know what data looks like pre-audit. So I think that the okay. other thing that is it may be easy to use. Be the audited data is easy to use because I've got schedules with clearly defined right. things um, to be consistent. Oh, right. so, so there's no the apples and oranges of, challenge, right. and they're not and changing. Then I throw away my comments and I'll okay. I think that's right. Just for ease of use, yep. go with audited data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Good. Because this is all conversation, and we need to then have it. What are we going to uh, present to the town council as a whole, so that they realize? that there is a usefulness for all seven members. It won't be just the three finance members. And we'll have to cross that bridge as we go. Um, You're welcome. Do you want to quickly talk about this? Sure. Yes. Um, you guys haven't seen it for a while. Um, great. But I met with, there's a really great group of people at USM, at the University of Southern Maine, that they're underneath the Muskie umbrella called the Data Innovation Project. Okay. And their entire purpose of being is to help nonprofit and public sectors better find data, access data, use it, and use it to inform decision making and use it to, sh and to share with the public what's happening. Okay, so I met with them, I sent them the, the first kind of go around of this dashboard. I said, here's what I've done so far. They don't like it, I don't like it, it's clunky. How do we make it look less clunky? And we met for a couple of hours a few weeks ago, and we came up with this draft. So I, what I guess I need, I want to kind of walk you through it. Um, I, Tom was very helpful in helping me see where things were not intuitive. <laughs> and I, so these, right, there's a little uh, legend at the bottom. So underneath the metrics that are policy-driven metrics, metrics that are we have listed with ranges of goals and may not exceed or may not um, go below in our financial and fiscal policy, you'll see these graphs here where the red line is the, the limit that the policy has established mm -hmm. and the yellow line is the goal. And I used yellow because I, I think that, that we, if that's our goal, we should consider anything crossing that line to be a warning. Okay, so, if, so let's look at this first one. This is for fiscal 17's audited data. Mm -hmm. So debt service is a percentage of annual revenues. We've established, and I apologize, I will find somebody whose skills are better than mine in Excel. You should have numbers here to show you what these are. And I apologize that you don't have them with you yeah. today. Okay. Yeah. But they are um, 15 and 12. The 15% is the red line, 12% is the yellow line. And this is showing three years history on that blue line. The blue line is what is the data for our town. So we can see that the red line is above the yellow line. So we should, we can, I, I hope we can intuit that that means that increasing on this is a bad thing. We'd Depending like to see it. Direction. Right, right. So we've, we've crossed that goal line in fiscal 17. So we are in kind of warning territory, right? We've, we've crossed our, our line, we're heading towards our limit. And so that's something that we want to watch and make sure that we're not going to be hitting that limit. Um, on the next one, total debt as a percentage of full state valuation. Um, this yellow bar is 3%. The red bar is 8.5%, I believe. Yes. Um, and so we are below 
the, the warning line. We're, we're doing well there, okay? Yeah. Um, for places where we don't have some, a, a limit in policy, so this debt per capita, our policy language, um, if you'll remember the, the just kind of soul-wrenching work that it was to come up with how to define how we're going to assess ourselves on debt per capita, it's based on not exceeding 115% of base year FY18. Well, I don't have a way to, to put a line there. I, 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 at least I haven't figured one out yet. I'm sure that there are people cleverer than I that can. So instead, what you have is you've got a trend line showing you three years' worth of, of trend on that. Um, and yes, in fiscal 18, that line's going to jump back up. Okay, we know because we took on the public safety building. And then you've got a little indicator down below in kind of stoplight language. Are we doing okay? Yeah. Green? Yep, we're good to go. Um, if you look directly below that with your general fund expenditures percentage of assessed value, that line is going up. I've told you this is one to watch. We don't want to see that line going up. We're going in the wrong direction. Let's kind of keep an eye on that. But we don't have set policy limits on those. Okay, so there's not a line to be crossed there. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a general, you know, we want to keep an eye on those things. And then um, I've also grouped them by kind of category. So your top one are in this kind of orangish color. Those are all debt related. Your blue ones are kind of more general fund and operational sort of numbers. And then this one off on its own is because it's, it's really its own thing um, that property tax assistance to be monitoring each year. I'm colorblind, so that's a different problem. It is, and it's not different enough. So I will take care of that. Um, but then, <laughs> down below, that's good, though. Um, I, like I heard Sean very clearly in our first discussions. He wanted a gauge. He, he's like, I remember him very clearly saying, "You want a gauge." So here's where I think we can put a gauge. If you want this sort of thing to be there to kind of have an overall quick picture, where do we stand? Again, I'm going to have to come back to you with proposed methodology. How are we weighting these metrics that are all measuring different things? Um, and then show you, you know, if, if this is the best we possibly could be, things couldn't get any better to, dear God, we better pack it up now. Um, show you how I, got, I chose that methodology, and if that's of interest, interest to you. That's great. I think this is awesome. Uh, the one recommendation I would have is that um, in moving this forward is that I would not actually put the methodology within that, um, that gauge um, chart, um, but make it a supplemental document to this. And the reason is that I think that if anything, I would like to see is a historical um, benchmark for each, whether it's on a quarterly basis, annual basis, semi-annual, whatever they might be. Because uh, what this doesn't show you is where we've been in the past. It only shows you where we are now. So uh, let's say, um, let's say, Bar chart, you mean? Uh, well, it would just be like a, an indicator. So on here on the left-hand side, it's where the words are. You could have fiscal year, um, and I'm being facetious, fiscal year um, 2015 could have been red. And you just have to have the red. You, the only need is a box that shows red. Fiscal year 16 could have been yellow. Fiscal year 17 is now green. Um, that way it kind of just shows the transition of the progression of where we've been. Okay over a longer period of time, whatever the intervals are that we're going to show within this, and then have whatever your, because that, that methodology document shouldn't change, okay. but yet the information on this first table ch changes. Okay, over sure. Right? And this is great work. The only, this is a great, yeah, very good. And just a small thing for me, and I, it's probably not enough room, but I love the, the little green, yellow things in the boxes that you don't have anything. Would it be easy to put, like, so for instance, that first block debt service as a percent of the where it's crossed over? Could you put a red just visually? You know what I mean? Put that little red. Or is there just not enough room? To so I absolutely can. I guess. Right there. Like, you know, these underneath here, you've got yep. like, okay, that's good. Let's make them so I absolutely oh, can. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah, absolutely yeah. can. I would, however, put a yellow there. Okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever color you like. Uh, so, but no, just, I absolutely can't. As long as it's not purple, because then it just screws up the whole chart. <laughs> but, right. but, that way, but that way, just visually, even if people don't understand the lines, right. they, they, they can just graphically say and it. And if, if it's equal weighting, yep. then you could, you could, you have a, a octagonal or whatever it is, box, one for each. And then, yeah. Okay. And sure. This, this and is great it, for by the way, at a very big bank I worked at, we had these type of desks that we call them uh, um, decks. Um, they actually used little stoplights. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Had the, the little stoplight. So whatever color was highlight was like the one that was the brightest cool. in the box. 
So th this is very common. This approach is very common. This, this um, is great. Maybe for our colorblind residents, because I do try to be thoughtful uh, of them. My husband is uh, extremely colorblind. Yeah. He, um, maybe I will inst I will make them so green hexagons, yellow triangles, red squares, so that you can uh, yeah. you can Good see yes. yep. whether you can see colors or not. You can just Good put a quick point. sense of is this. I guess I'm putting judgments on squares. They're now bad, but we're going to just move on. And yeah, but you'll have a little okay. uh, key. A, a ledger, absolutely. A ledger key. For my purposes, diff uh, grouping these metrics isn't all that helpful. I think it might be confusing things just by different colors. Do you have any opinion about that? Other than, uh, no. I hung up on that one way or the other. <clears throat> I was thinking, in the heading is where you could indicate your color in terms of huh? watch or not. So we'll yeah. take all this under advisement oh, okay. and see if we can come up. It's great work. Yeah, it's great work. Perfect. Sorry, Perfect. 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 Yeah. How long have you spent this? The whole dashboard. This has been three years. When, we, when you and I got elected the first time in 14. But it was all wrapped up in working through that policy, oh, identifying what they it's are. It's pretty cool stuff, and I, I think if we get rolling on it, then it could be very valuable to us. And one other thing I'd ask of staff, as we went down through this, we did mention that there's some things we just don't have policies for. Is that something we should put on our, our revisit list? To... Uh, so, so I, as I mentioned earlier tonight, love it when we have clearly defined goals and limits. So I would be delighted to have council agree on one, what is a warning sign for us for general fund expenditure as a percentage of assessed value? I think you should be prepared for the same wrangling conversation that we had to deal with with debt per capita. Okay, so I, I think that the, the challenge there is that's really philosophical. There's going, I don't think, there is no industry standard for those metrics. Okay, because it is a question of comfort, a question of priorities, a que right, so, Yes, it's great to have you know, policies that are, are giving us guidance consistently across councils about what we should be doing. Just please be prepared that that's going to be a real challenging conversation. At a future date, do you want to come back with a recommendation as a first start? Oh, dear God. No I wonder, timeline. I wonder whether you know, our bond guy. I was going to suggest Joe. We've I mean, looked at industry standards. Uh, this committee has debated many of these metrics yeah. back and forth, yeah. and yeah. frankly, well, fiscal, we're not able to come to terms. Right, yeah, fiscal right. help. Yeah. I mean, when the bond, our bond, bond expert, Joe, Joe, tells us we're good, then I think that these are should be reflecting good. And if if he was saying your fiscal health is not good, then you would think that these would match up with that. Um, if we're bringing Joe into the conversation, I'm warning you right now, he agrees with me wholeheartedly that debt per capita has no place on our dashboard. Um, and so you should be prepared to have that well, conversation that's, again. Well, that's what I mean. I want to know. Okay, let's, it took us forever to agree to it. I don't yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> I, and notice it's there. It's there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to Cheerfully and joyfully. Okay. <laughs> this is a great start. So. Great start. Maybe we well can back with the changes we just talked about. Sure. Share. That's great. Thank you. Last agenda item. Financials. Again, these are unaudited, so <coughs> I expect them to change. Uh, we've comparing our expenditures. We're approximately, you know. At the end of June 2018, it looks like we're about 98.3% right now. And at the end of last year, 2017, we were at 98.7. So to Councillor Donovan's point, we're pretty consistent year to year. Uh, in terms of our tax collections, as Larissa mentioned, last year or at June 30th, right now we're at 99.1. And in 2017, we were at 99.1. And in uh, June of 2016, we were 98% collected. And so, you know, our collections are very good. So, so can I, um, can we do this? Uh, I want to keep it at the highest level, so I, but I have a couple of questions. Only because sure. I'm trying to remember what some of the unaudited or the audited the um, adjustments that can come in. So uh, just starting at general fund expenditures, the total, 
So 98.3% is 36.7 million versus 37.5 that was appropriated. So out of the 1.2 million, what would you see as um, an unlike, um, as a probable either post audit or um, is there any type of expenditure that we're waiting for that hasn't? So remember, there's a couple of big ones that sometimes come in late. I don't know if it's the county tax or. Um, it has to do mostly with some of the year-end transfers that we make between departments between funds uh, uh -huh. so we have our some of our TIF revenues we generate those are transfers between special revenue funds and the general fund some of those have or have not been made school impact fees the funds are collected in special revenues and then there's a once an annual transfer to the general fund and that causes an expenditure and that right. It's an ex it's a it's a revenue on the town side on the general fund side and it's an expenditure on the special revenue right. side. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, it's those types of things. There's um, accounts payables that are theoretically those are done, but we're still seeing receivables. There are some things we don't get from the state right away. I think it's uh, it's not very big, but still it's like uh, it's either tree growth or veterans. It's one of those types of things. So. Those are the kinds of things that we're supposed to be getting, hopefully before June. We don't usually get them until around now. So those are the kinds of things that will impact these final numbers. Uh, the auditors will then come in and take a look at our expenditures. They kind of do a review. They pick certain invoices and receipts. And last year, the school department <coughs> excuse me, was written up as part of their uh, management comments because they took a uh, some CIP project and they put it in the in in the 2018 year and the auditor said no it should have been in 2017 and it was a large enough number that it became a, a year-end comment and that adjusted some of the numbers that we were working with we had that happen with us a few years ago as well so it's it's how they interpret expenditures or revenues and how we interpret them and so so they will come back with some additional adjustments potentially These are all up on the town's finance uh, website, so uh, any citizen who wants to take a look at them can look at them. So, hey, do you want to talk a little bit about fund balance? Is it actually, is it just how this is presented? Does the fund balance actually go down by four hundred thirty-five thousand? Is that on page one of the yeah, fund yeah. balance? I know somehow the actual revenues and actual expenditures sometimes throws off. Is that do the, the fund balances actually overall decrease? Fund balance in it, it potentially might be, but again, some of these revenues and expenditures between funds haven't shown up yet, so those will close to the general fund and, and fund balance, and those haven't happened yet as part of this. I know uh, some of the receivables were posted, but not all of them, so at the point where we made this so that would increase our revenues which would then flow into fund balance so if you had a guess did our did our fund balance actually increase or decrease once all the adjustments are done did we in terms of i guess i'm not really comfortable responding to that yet per our policy our fund balance Goal for unassigned fund balance should be eight million three sixty seven, three sixty seven. So um, these numbers here that are listed on the first page, we don't actually have them broken out between assigned and unassigned. I think that's something we're going to have to work on in term, in our financial software package to get that to show so that they do align with our policy and with with you know the financial statements themselves. So some of the numbers that are in these numbers are um, probably going to change a little bit. I'm not sure that it's going to go up or down. I know we did receive five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, how the, the it, is this fund balance total? Looking at the unaudited June eighteen uh, of thirteen million four sixty three. Where, where does that number come from? Is that derived from the numbers above it? Yes, adding or subtracting it depending on which way they... But you're not taking into account actual revenue or actual expenditures. Those don't count, right? 
I think what they're doing is it's taking the difference between the two of them and then however that impacts that bottom line. So technically, actual revenues would increase your fund balance, actual expenditures will decrease it. Oh, okay. So there's the $400,000 difference. Right. Yeah, but I'm just I'm trying to anticipate if these are up on the website, whether people are going to say, did we end up with a... No, I, I, I think to, um, in... I'm a little bit confused by the explanation, but I think, if I understand this based on the explanation, is that expenditures, actual expenditures of $435,000 greater, generally speaking, because the other numbers are flat, are generally $435,000 greater. The reason is that the expenditure has been posted, but yet the revenue has not been yet not transferred. Not all the revenues have been shown. So that's some additional revenue. Okay, so there's the additional no. revenue. And that's because if you then look on page two, if you look, while well, there's 600000 and I'm... Um, Rough estimating it, eight hundred thousand, six hundred, um, whatever the number is for the town up above. That's one thing. I think those are more accurate. The issue is going to be about general fund for the schools because there's a two million dollar difference. I can tell you that's not a surplus in schools. That has to deal with a revenue source that hasn't come in. Oh, um, that's the other piece is fund source, balance, right? Fund balance allocations, which yeah. the school had that two million. Yep. Yeah. That's not reflected as a revenue. Right. So that's that's will impact these numbers because we're not, by auditing standards, we don't take money out of our so fund balance and show it as a revenue. will be audited numbers. By the end of yes. December, they'll be audited numbers. Good. Okay. And I might, and this is a big guess, since I'm not the town's funding, I would even suggest there might even be a small surplus overall. Yeah, that's, where, that's where I thought we were. I thought we were thinking and the other surplus. piece is... Um, Part of our bond premiums that we received, we received 500000 in bond premium yes. that we were going to. So that will be come a committed or assigned fund balance when we finalize the audit because yes. we're going to, we purposely are going to use those funds to pay debt service in November. Yes. That was month. part of the decision this committee yes. made. We, uh, we ended up borrowing less than we needed mm -hmm. using bond premium yes. and, and used some of that bond premium to pay yes. debt service. And so even though that does close to fund balance and that will be reflected in these fund balance numbers, we're going to pull it out of unassigned and say we can't really use it because we've designated it for another purpose. Um, Peter, before we get into the dates, if I can make a recommendation for uh, the chair of the committee. For the next finance, I'm mean, sorry, for the next finance report, um, I would actually recommend if you wanted to, um, I think we really need to show um, this benchmark report um, that Lewis has done. I think this is a, a great message, along with a copy of the statements, and then even this with a small explanation about that way we can at least give them some heads up about what might be coming down the line for the next meeting. Just as the part of the council. report, yeah, town council. Yeah, I think it's a uh, as a part of the chair. It's just it's chairs. It's information purposes only. It would be helpful, I think, to give them a heads up that this finance committee is moving ahead with this stuff. And it's really important. Stamp it all draft. Do you want yep. this June thirtieth report? Because I also we we do have the reports for September thirtieth. I just I think whatever you submitted to the council is best to be shared. I'm sorry, this committee is what should be shared with the council. Okay. Peter, if you want to do that tomorrow, I have a rather full day tomorrow. No, I can. We can do it. Uh, are, well, you, are you okay doing it the next? Time? Were you thinking tomorrow? Night? I was thinking tomorrow night, but that's totally up to you guys. I just, I, I'm, I can't make all the changes you've asked to see yeah, by tomorrow. So, I, if, which is, I, if you want to show them what's drafted and let them know that there are changes coming, that's fine. I just want you to the, kind of it's, share it's expectations. Yeah. Let, Peter can report it out in December okay. uh, and, and get people up to speed. Because this committee's going to be working on this. Regular thing. Well, this I think reporting is very helpful, but doesn't have to be done. Just, you can speak to it tomorrow night without Without, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, the future date, what we do have just as a marker is Tuesday, November 20th. Um, so we'll keep that on the, on the calendar. Um, next item is public comment, but there's no public, so that's pretty straightforward and then move to just motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Great work guys. Great. Thank you very much. So these are based on June 17th. These yeah. reports have June 17th. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 The socks are up.
I don't think no, that these had.